Uh, tell me about your program. What is it called? Well, we're called the Saskatchewan Indigenous Cultural Centre, and our mandate is to pr promote, preserve, and protect culture and languages for the Indigenous First Nations in Saskatchewan. There's eight linguistic groups here, three dialects of Cree, the Plains Cree, the Swampy Cree, and the Woodland Cree. And we have our Dene to the far north, and we have the Soto people, and Nakoda, Dakota, and Lakota people. So those are our eight linguistic groups. So what we do here is SICC was founded as a, a means to, well, what I said as our mandate is promote and preserve the culture and the language, but more than that is they want to record. So we do a lot of recording here. We do a lot of elder interviews, knowledge keeper interviews, and that's our way of trying to preserve some of the stories and some of the, I guess, the visions of the past and how the, how we're meeting those visions today. So a, a lot of the previous or the founders or previous people who were involved with the center, their goal was to have an institute where their language and their culture could be respected. It could be honest, and it could be truthful, and it could be shared. So that's pretty much our mandate. And because of the residential school syndrome, which we all know about now, back then, I think they must have known something back then, even though they didn't say that. But a process was started to preserve a lot of that information that we're actually using now. And now we're able to pu publish education materials from really young people to really old people and we have a collection of um, art from a lot of our artists and many of them have passed on. Art is a way of talking and, and I guess you would know that with your degree in fine arts. It's a way of telling a story. A lot of the artists are gone now and, uh, and I guess it's like a vision. It's up to interpretation. When we look at it we can um, try and figure out what they mean or what they were trying to say. So we have a collection of art that we maintain here. We also have a collection of books. They're all Indigenous authors, anything to do with our people. So um, when I talked to you earlier, or I said earlier about the truth, I think that's what they were getting at, is we want to have things that talk, tell us the truth. Right now, in 2018, it's becoming apparent that uh, a lot of a lot more people are coming on board because when we were at the signing last week of the MOU with the school boards in Saskatchewan, they talked about the truth hasn't been told. Mm. You know, when we're dealing with the truth and reconciliation, and everybody's trying to, their hardest to reconcile, but before we can do that, we have to talk about the truth. And we get to the truth through the stories of our people. And uh, a lot of them are not here anymore. A lot of them have passed. So we were able to um, save a lot of their words into um, paper materials. So we get to use that. We're governed by a board of uh, governors that are made up of 12 First Nations in Saskatchewan. So they represent all the linguistic groups. We have a elder on there from... Uh, the senator, we have a lady on there from the Ladies' Commission. We're an institute that was started or under the mandate of the FSIN. So we work closely with them. They generally provide us with support and we provide them with support and materials as well. We also have a Elders Council and they're made up of the eight linguistic groups. And we generally meet, you know, two to four times per year. So when they provide us with direction and guidance and support. Uh, so sometimes we have to deal with tough issues like repatriation of remains that have been unearthed somewhere, um, those types of things that we, that we need to um, deal with. And, and I think their main interest is to gather more fluent speakers in all the linguistic groups. So we're always thinking of strategies and of course they share with us a lot of their stories and a lot of their prayers. Are there age groups or a target audience? No, we try and work like we were um, community based. Okay. So we try and respond to the community okay. needs. A lot of the community needs right now are in education from pre K, early learning to, I guess, grade 12. Like a lot of the focus right now is in education. So we're responding to that by developing different types of materials that they can use in their classrooms. 
So um, we're not targeting any specific age. It's kind of like we allow the communities to let us know what they need. And um, then we customize our materials or our programs around them. So sometimes that means formal curriculum that will go into a school. And sometimes that means, you know, developing a set of dialogues for a language nest in a community. So we're doing that in a generic sense, and then we can have it translated into any of the linguistic groups. It makes it easier for everyone in their guidelines. The curriculum we're using in the schools right now that we're providing, we do have to meet certain outcomes, provincial outcomes. And what we did was we had um, worked with a group from the North Balford area that worked with elders for, I don't know, years. And they had their elder outcomes meet the provincial outcomes. So now they're kind of in sync. When the provincial outcome says this, mm -hmm. the elders say this. So we were able to take both of those and develop a, a curriculum they could use in school for land-based education. Is this program an example of excellence in Indigenous education? I believe it is. I, I, I think it it is an example of excellence because it comes from the communities. It's community-driven. It's based on, and I, and I like to say this, like we don't say it enough, it's based on the truth. They're telling us the truth, and they haven't been heard. You know, they have these inquiries with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and not now the Murdered and Missing Women inquiries, and people get to talk there. But there is no place where people can talk about uh, a lot of the things they want to talk about. So they come and talk to us about um, the gaps, I guess, what's missing. You know, when they have hindsight now, they're able to look back and... And uh, that's what we listen to. So I think it's only excellence and example is because it's coming from them. It's driven by them. And we're trained. We're the, we're the worker bees. You know, we do the work on their behalf and for what their objectives are. So I, And I think our mandate is general enough to accommodate that specific mandate and to generally be able to respond to, like we can't do everything, we're a small staff, it's a big province, we have close to 200,000 First Nation citizens, we have um, seven to ten staff at any given time, so we can only respond as best we can, and usually that's trying to find a way, like the generic curriculum, or the generic language guidelines that can be converted into any language. We do have a huge network and a lot of outreach we do. So we use a lot of people in committee forms, and that's another way of getting community perspective. I've been here for a year, just over a year. I started last January. There has not been a way of really doing a really good assessment on, you know, vision to pre-development, development, and then implementation, and then maintenance. So there, there, there's no long, even though we're 45 years old, there isn't any way of assessing. Because I can tell you how I think we're going to measure success. But that's not, and I think that's how it was done in the past. So what I'm trying to set up right now is a process of where we do exactly that. And um, right now, the only way I can answer that is to say, if one of our programs is being extremely useful, like our storytelling, very important, it's like so hugely in demand that it's hard for us to keep up to that, to me, is a measurement of success. And then we have a couple other programs that we just sort of canceled because there was no uptake, there was no interest, there wasn't a lot of people showing up to the events. And, and that's where I say, okay, it's time to pull the plug on that one. That's sort of seen its better days. So besides that type of, um, and, and I guess those are just decisions you make on a daily basis, like are we going to put our scarce resources into doing this um, when this one's hugely successful. So um, like our Language Keepers Conference every year is just to talk about language and culture. They're so um, intertwined with each other. So um, this past year in November of 2017 was the biggest number they've ever gotten. So to me, 
that's a measurement of success because it keeps, and that one was very responsive to the communities and all the linguistic groups. So all eight linguistic groups were represented there. They had something for everyone to do. There was over 600. So we surpassed previous numbers by over 100. Yeah, so to me that's a measure of success that we need to keep doing this and doing it and building on what was the best of last year. How would you define the word Indigenous? Uh, is this a term that you normally use? Well, Indigenous education is a new term that... Well, I'm not going to say it's a new term because it's been used in an international level. Mm. To describe... I always, I always felt like it was to describe the people closest to the land. How I say that is people closest to the source, which are the brown people, I'll say. Mm. So those became the Indigenous people. And I always say, like, these non-Native people, like the, the white people from Europe and uh, wherever else they came from, they used to be tribal people. They used to be Indigenous people. But they developed these principles of colonization, mm. which they did to themselves. They practiced it, and, and it worked, you know, and they developed this whole... So now they went around the world because they thought this is such a great model, we're going to colonize everybody. So they went around the world doing that. But we, us brown people, are still the people closest to the source, which means we're closest to the land. Mm -hmm. They're probably 11 or 12 generations removed. We might be too. Um, there's a lot of people who, a lot of our people who don't live on the land. So that term indigenous, to me, means all those people who are closest to the source. So that is the brown people, right? Yeah. Where whatever country you go in, it's uh, those people. So that's what that term to me means. Using that term here, it's been new. So it, it grasps more than just the First Nations in Saskatchewan. They're talking about the indigenous people, the um, people who are closest to the source. It's a term, I guess, the UN uses in a specific way. Um, and they'll have all kinds of definitions for it. So what I'm saying to you is how I view it and how I've been taught to view it. How would you define education? I think to have our education and be able to have this... this I'm not going to say we're grateful to have this opportunity. I'm just going to say it's about damn time. Because we've been not valued for that in the bigger world. Well, now all of a sudden it's becoming a value and it's... It's the catchphrase of the day, and everybody wants to have these partnerships, and they want to do the reconciliation. And that's all fine and dandy, but we need to hear the truth first. Education is how we're going to hear the truth. Growing up in school, I don't know your experience, I never learned about this stuff. Our elders taught us, so that was never taught in school. You know, when they talk about the treaties and the spirit and intent of the treaties, they talk about all this. And if you close your eyes in and try and envision it, you see this big you know, ceremony where everybody's been consulted, they're all informed and they know what's going on and you're like, no, they weren't. If you knew the history, they were starving. Mm -hmm. They were falling apart. You know, it. they were grasping. They had no choice. So they felt like they had to do that and that's why these documents are sacred documents because of what people died for that. You know what I mean? And we mm -hmm. need to honor that and respect it, the only way we're going to do that is through education. And it has to be the truth. And they have to hear those hard truths. And that's what I think it is. So we get to control the message. And um, I like it that they're coming to talk now. What is that message? You know, when signing this MOU meant to me, like, we finally get... Do we actually get to tell the truth? First we signed, we said we would, but when we go do it, Sometimes, you know, the truth hurts, they might not want to read it. And I think a lot of the racism right now around that Pushy case in North Alford has to do with a lot to do with ignorance. And on both parts, like our, a lot of our people don't know our history, our, our stories, our, um, you know, the things that people had to do to ensure that they were still here and able to speak their own language. And it's not perfect. But our ancestors, I think we're wise enough to see the future, to know that they had to do something, even though it wasn't something perfect. And that story needs to be told to everybody. So that's, to me, what Indigenous education is. What is your vision for the future of Indigenous education in your community and in Canada? 
my vision for the future is to start working with a lot of the like the early childhood learning facilities you know the daycares and the head starts and and you know what little kids are so pure and innocent and open they wouldn't have all these blocks when they start hearing stories you know they would have this true feeling you know whatever that feeling is and I think that needs to start there with the older people who have developed you know prejudices all this other stuff that blocks people and sometimes it's like addictions whatever it is that blocks people from moving ahead you have to deal with the health of those people first you know whether it be physical or mental health you got to deal with that first before they can start learning so I think my vision in the future is to start working with the younger kids and start talking about it before you know told what we were told in school and uh, which was the truth or it was nothing you know you read all these history books there's absolutely nothing in there like what happened to us we're all here like how come we're not in there how did we get to be here so um, I, I think it's really important that um, we start working with the younger people and focusing on that for uh, not just the schools on the reserves or the schools that are First Nation controlled in Saskatoon or Regina or whatever urban center but all the public schools because everybody needs to know the truth like they have a right whether or not anyone agrees with them to be able to hear the truth so working with all those little kids and then reconnecting people with the land like a lot of our teachings go a lot of my teachings were done outside on the land whether if they were just talking to you camping or in a ceremony or harvesting medicines or harvesting food whatever it was a lot of those teachings come in that area I think we need to make space for them and maybe in the future our school year won't look the way it looks right now you know what I mean it could be very different than what it is right now because right now it's following a process that was um, designed to support a system that isn't conducive to supporting harmonious teachings because to be in harmony with nature you need to learn about it so the school system is not based on that our school system is and and those won't hurt to have those types of um, so I, I don't know my vision for the future is really big we need to really focus on you know doing some of our teachings outside you know having kids sitting there and listening to some of our knowledge keepers and in, pl in places like um, the cultural center and our board of governors and our board or our council of elders why are we not accredited to teach our own children why do we have to have an external place give us an accreditation of PhD when we should be issuing those PhDs to people we know lived and earned that life that they have or maybe we have our own way of accrediting our own people to teach because it worked for us like we're still here no matter what they tried to do for yeah. us we're still here so um, it can work for them too so that's kind of my vision for the future it's kind of a big one but you know who knows <laughs> <laughs> can you think of any types of information that if you had now it would help to achieve your vision you know it would be really good to know how other people really feel like I know they talk about reconciliation the city of Saskatoon the school boards the provincial government now has a indigenous relations department you know the federal government they all say that but I'd like to know what they really mean because sometimes when it rolls out it's not what they say and uh, it would be nice to know that because then you could know where to put your energy and not waste it you know if you're going to go down the path of wasted energy there's more funner paths to take that you mm. waste just as much energy aside from the programs in which you are personally involved what information do you have on other indigenous educational programs in canada there's actually a lot of really good educational programs in canada the first people's cultural center in bc has some really really amazing work going on there the manitoba education council i forget their formal name but they have like tons of stuff going on there the Micmac in Nova Scotia they have like and we get to share with each other and because of this language act the federal language act we get together actually quite often and we get to meet with them and we, we get to share stories about what works what doesn't work what are they trying different types of programs 
so we get to share information and support each other too so there there is a lot going on out there it just hasn't been i guess displayed or promoted you know marketed so a lot of people don't know what's going on uh, there's a lot of land-based education activities going on even though we've been doing that our whole entire life and it's not actually a fun thing for some communities to do because that's how they live right so they're like well, our idea of a week off from school is not going and living in a tent in the bush because we do that all the time. It's going to the city. So um, we've been doing that for a long time, but I noticed that almost all these institutions now are sort of leaning towards that land-based to learn the culture and reconnect. Because I think once you reconnect with the land and your natural environment, all these other things start coming natural. And then you feel protected because you're connected to it. Like it's You, you want to protect it. So I think that's, um, there, there are a lot going on. They just need to be heard.